This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 25th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular weekly segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss a recent article confirming that there will be no special session on a fiscal plan. The ADN editorial board's reaction to that and ours as well. Second, we discuss our problem with the Dunleavy administration's announcement of and the subsequent reporting on this year's PFD. And third, we explain how the Permanent Fund Corporation is beginning to push for changes in the Permanent Fund structure and why we think both their approach is disingenuous and the goal wrong. And now let's join Michael. Today, Brad, we're going to talk about uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some things, and it's all kind of circulating around um, the permanent fund and what's going on there in Alaska's fiscal situation. First things first, um, there's no special session coming up. Uh, there was a lot of posturing, and kind of some of us already knew this really wasn't going to happen, but there was a lot of posturing, and then the ADN put out a story here last week uh, about the fact that uh, the, the powers that be have said there's going to be no fiscal session, and then they had a reaction, and so did you, the ADN did. So let's uh, let's start talking about that first. That's number one. So um, the ADN ran a, well, James Brooks wrote an article for the Alaska Beacon that's been picked up by most of the newspapers in the state. The headline in the ADN version was, no special session this year on fiscal issues, Alaska legislators say. And and yes, I, I we all knew this was coming. We'd known it was coming since Governor Dunleavy vetoed the money that had been appropriated for the special session uh, in the budget, vetoed it out of the budget. Uh, Dunleavy later said, uh, the governor's office later said that uh, they didn't perceive that the legislature wanted to go forward to it, go forward with it. And so they weren't going to push it if the uh, legislature wasn't going to go forward with it. And uh, and and this is the the story from James Brooks is just confirming confirming that the legislature doesn't want to go forward with it. There's really nothing new to that aspect of the story. But in reporting on the story, there's a couple of things uh, that I found really interesting uh, in the body of the story. And the first is uh, Speaker Kathy Tilton, uh, who James interviewed for the story. Um, you had this to say, and this is this is disturbing not only from the standpoint of no special session, but from the standpoint of next session. Um, the, the, the comment is this, continued disagreement over the elements of a comprehensive fiscal plan have members of the House now preparing to advance bills separately rather than as a comprehensive whole, said Speaker of the House Kathy Tilton. We've realized that we don't have the numbers to come to a consensus on a full plan with lots of components, maybe we'll try to focus on something that takes care of the permanent fund dividend issue, like HJR seven. And HJR seven is the proposed constitutional amendment that would that would constitutionalize uh, the PFD. We need to go back to the. I mean that to me that's a recipe for failure. We need to go back to the uh, the fiscal policy working group and recall their advice. After they, you know, this is this is members of the legislature from both the right and left, from both the Republican and the Democrat sides, from both the Senate and the House, working together to try to identify something that would work. And and the 
the one theme or a theme that resonated through that entire piece, uh, the entire report that the Fiscal Policy Working Group put out was everything's got to work together. That, that some things are important to some players, other things are important to other players, still other things are important to other players. And, and if you don't have a comprehensive package that fits all of the various interests, you're not going to have, you're not going to have a vote. You're not going to have a successful vote uh, on any of the pieces. It's all got to come together uh, to work together. I don't think anything has changed since the fiscal policy, since the fiscal policy working group put out that piece. And so Tilton's uh, comments about we can't um, continue disagreement over elements of the plan have members of the House now preparing to advance a uh, bill separately. Uh, I think that's just a recipe for failure uh, in the coming session. I mean, the coming session is, is tough anyway. Oil prices are up. It's an election year. Right. Uh, but uh, it, it, this is an admission, uh, I think, on Tilton's part that that is that is problematic. The, the key is that everybody's got to compromise to get to a solution. Nobody's going to get all of what they want. You know, the people who, who say, Oh, it's got to be a full statutory PFD, nothing else. We do that. Then we'll talk about other things. They're not going to get that. The people who say, uh, Oh, there's got to be deep budget cuts first before we'll do anything else. They're not going to get that. And you, and you just go on through the entire, the entire list and, and you don't have enough votes for any one thing to get that out. So, uh, I I took this as 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 problematic not only from the standpoint of a special session, which as I said we've known for a long time isn't going to happen. I take it as problematic from the standpoint of uh, of of the of the ongoing process. There's a, another piece in here, and I think I may have just lost it from Delana Johnson. Another quote in here from Delana Johnson. Here it is. Representative Delana Johnson, Republican Palmer and co-chair of the House Finance Committee, said the core of the issue is whether legislators are willing to authorize taxes in order to pay for larger dividends. I think there's a disagreement, and I think it's throughout the legislature, about the idea of whether there should be a tax to pay out a PFD, and that's the crux of it. You know, with, with, friends, like the, with friends like these, who the hell needs enemies? I, it's Right. I had a I had a little bit of a mini meltdown over this article, specifically over that line when it came out, because I'm like, why do we keep reusing this this tired, battered old argument? Because that's not what it that's not it's not correct. Delana, if you're listening, one more time, PFDs are fully fully paid for. Taxes aren't to pay for PFDs. Taxes are to pay for other government spending. PFDs are covered by statute that you've sworn to uphold by statute from permanent fund earnings. There is no need for taxes to pay for PFDs. They're covered. What taxes are needed for is to cover the remainder of, of government spending. And that's what PFD cuts are. They are taxes on the PFD, isolated, targeted taxes on the PFD in order to pay for government spending. And so... <laughs> To say that to say that we need taxes to pay for PFDs is just, Delaney, you're going in the wrong direction. I mean, I mean, you, some of your Democrat colleagues, some of your progress, Sarah Hannon couldn't have done it better. Um, and and I, you may have been down there too long if if that's if that's the way you're thinking. So you know, there's this article also brought out comments, other quotes that I that that are problematic. This led the the article and sort of the build up to this led to a screed. From the from the Daily News editorial board, uh, which sometimes I call the Binkley family blog, but I'll try to refrain from that today. <laughs> we'll, um, just call, we'll just call it a screed instead. Okay, that's it. <laughs> a screed from the from the ADN uh, 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 editorial board uh, in a in a weekend editorial that says the Alaska legislature's fiscal short sightedness wears thin. And basically, it's a screed against the PFD and the P and and their view that the PFD holds everything up. Um, and and there's a line in there that goes, they want to enshrine the dividend in the Alaska Constitution, thus play, placing its payment ahead of every other fiscal priority, including those like education and public safety that our state's framers considered so important that Alaska's founding documents specifically address the government's responsibility to provide them. He, here's here's the core of. I think I think this this editorial actually helped isolate for me the core of the problem I have 
with not only the ADA and editorial board, but maybe Delana Johnson and, and others, they view the PFD as government spending, government spending. Right. And, and so they line it up as, as in a priority as less than other government spending, like K through 12, health services, public safety, uh, that sort of stuff. They keep moving it down the chain by lining it up uh, against that. And frankly, Delena falls into that same trap. When Delena says you need to, that it'd be taxes to pay for government, to pay for the PFD, what she's really saying is it's you need taxes to pay for the government spend of the PFD. The, every account, virtually every economist who's look at, looked at this and, and what influences me it takes a different, an entirely different view of PFD cuts. They view PFD cuts as revenue, and they compare the whether you ought to be using whether you ought to be taking PFD cuts. Compare that to other revenue sources, and find that PFD as a revenue source, PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Have, are the are the most regressive have the harsh, harshest impact, the largest adverse impact on Alaska families, 80% of Alaska families. They take that view because they view it as revenue. And I think, I think to some degree, the real crux of the issue is whether you view PFDs as spending, as the ADM tries to em repeatedly emphasize and, and push it down the, the priority list, or as Natasha or as Bert and others view it and try to push it down the list by comparing it to other spending, or if you view it as I do, and as the economists do, as a source of revenue, and when you view it that way, the PFD is the worst thing you possibly can do. So I, I, I'm going to try to start talking about this more, this, this, this difference between viewing it as spending and or viewing it as a source of revenue. I'm going to try to talk, right. start talking about that more because well, I think it, it, helps, it helps people understand where this difference is coming from. I would agree with that. Um, and it's so it's so funny because the 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 ADN editorial board continues to I mean, it's like they're mixing metaphors and, and they're getting confused. Uh, the thing that stuck out to me, we don't have any real time left on this segment, but it said maybe there's state residents who are so cynical that they're willing to trade their children's education for a fat government check each year. But that's not Alaskans, at least not the Alaskans we know. Uh, I mean, first of all, I don't, it's not a government check. It's part of our, but okay. Anyway, it goes on and said, despite the mega PFD hardliners attempts to don the mantle of fiscal conservatism, they've been perfectly happy to spend 18 billion in state savings over the past decade, rather than accept the reality that our revenues can no longer support the, have their, have their cake and eat it too. I have not met any fiscal conservative that has been okay with the size and scope of state spending. They've wanted you to follow the damn law, pay the PFDs, and live within our means. But see, they're mixing this whole thing together. They're projecting their own feelings on this. They were perfectly okay with the massive government spend. They just didn't want to give you your money to do it. And and that's part of the problem here, is that there is such a mixed uh, a bag of feelings on this thing. And because they believe that it's all just a big government welfare check, they believe they should control it instead of being Alaska's, uh, instead of being Alaskans slice of the pie, so to speak. Yeah. They, they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay for all the government spending themselves. They don't want to pay for all the true government spending, the K through 12, the, the health, the public safety. They don't want to pay for all that themselves. So they, so they've created this construct where the PFD is spending also. And so we can cut spend, we can cut PFD spending and that's okay. And Hey, we don't have to pay for the other stuff because, because we've done it by cutting the PFD without recognizing that cutting the PFD is taking it out, isolate, isolating it on middle and lower income Alaska families and, and, and right. allowing them to escape. I read that opinion piece. Uh, I was so agitated after I read that opinion piece because it just, it, again, it blames people who were wanting more fiscal responsibility and then lays the $18 billion in spending at their feet because they wanted you to follow the law or change the law and live within our means. And uh, it's just, it's just so 
so ridiculous overall. And then this idea that somehow we're going to have to take this a piece at a time, which is a, the, the the fiscal plan a piece at a time, which is exactly what the fiscal policy working group said you can't do. It has to be holistically. And that just nobody can come together. I mean, Brad, does this thing just have to hit the wall and then we got to pick up the pieces? Is that what's going to have to happen here? Boy, I hope not, Michael, because because the, the trajectory we're on hitting the wall means the PFD is eliminated. I mean, the trajectory right. we're on, um, uh, given where the legislature is, given where the pow powers that be, the, the ADN and others are trying to push it, uh, hitting the wall means the PFD is gone. And, and then, you know, and then they think, well, once we've used up everybody else's money, <laughs> Once we've used up middle and lower income Alaska families' money, then we'll stop it. You know, we'll stop it uh, at, at that point. We'll stop the spending at that point. But but we're going to use up their money first uh, before before we uh, before we put on the brakes. Um, and that's and and that's where the that's where the brakes are. So I I I I'm, I'm going to I fully respect somebody like Ben Carpenter. Who's who's gone to the time, the trouble, the effort to to bring uh, to try to bring a comprehensive plan together? Who's who's followed up on the fiscal policy working group and tried to bring it together? I don't, frankly, at this point, respect Kathy Tilton as a speaker who's supposed to be driving the train. Maybe you can't drive that train, but who's supposed to be driving the train as okay. leadership? Uh, who's sort of giving up on it? It, it um, is giving up on it treating it piecemeal is the is the re, is the recipe the tactic to try to kill the pfd because you're never going to get the pfb pfd protected on its own through this legislature um and through through this or any other legislature i think we found you're never going to get the pfd protected on its own and as long as you try to go at this stuff piecemeal they'll just keep chipping away at the pfd until until it's gone so, you know, when you say, I'm going to give up on trying to do a comprehensive plan, we're going to deal with little parts of it. What you're really saying is I'm okay with killing the PFD. And, and that's, that I think is hugely problematic. So I, I, I was greatly disappointed when I read that article and I read Tilton's comments. I mean, I just, uh, that's just, you know, if I were Ben, I'd just be banging my head against the wall, I think by now. Right. Right. Uh, because it, it because you need leadership. Yes, you got a diverse body. That's why you that's why you run for leader. So you can try to, you know, pull that diverse body together toward objectives. If the objectives of the House Republican uh, majority is to have a fiscal plan, she just just shot it in the head. And I and I don't know what I don't know what the hell the objective is of the House Republican right. majority. I mean, shouldn't this be the number one priority of the majority in the House right now is to try and push this above above everything else? Shouldn't every other bill pretty much be sidelined until I mean, shouldn't at this point, shouldn't we use the process uh, the way it's intended and basically table every other bill until we are forced to deal with these issues on the fiscal plan? Because it's going to kill us otherwise. That's what she said. That's what she said. The House Republican majorities. One priority was to develop a fiscal plan, a fiscal plan. Um, and 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 now she's giving halfway through her term as speaker, she's giving up on that plan. I just I, I, I don't I don't know what I don't know what we're doing to Frank, quite frankly, over on the house. Welcome back. Uh, the Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. Brad Keithley, our guest. The weekly top three continues. Oh, oh, oh boy. And uh, this uh, this time on to number two, we're talking about the PFD, specifically the announcement of the PFD that happened this last week and the reporting on it by the various outlets. Brad has issues with it. I mean, that's surprising. <laughs> that's surprising. Uh, Brad, give it give it to us. Give it to us here. Well, so the, 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 as is the case when you approach October, the administration announced the PF number. PFD number announced it very proudly. It wasn't any great surprise. We'd known about it since the session that it was uh, going to be $1,300 or thereabouts. And it turned out to be what? 1,312. So we got 12 more dollars. Well, well, as, a, extra dollars. as, that, as opposed to that's two lattes. I mean, it's great. <laughs> um, uh, 
but we knew the, we knew it was going to be that since uh, since the since the you know the session ended and the governor signed the bill that that reflected a thirteen hundred dollar uh, PFD. It was it was the manner of the announcement that sort of that sort of bugs me. And and Todd Smolden, God love him, Todd, if you're listening, I, you're you're a great man and everything. But Todd Smolden just really sort of encapsulated my problem. Oh boy, hang on a second, computer, come back. Todd, Todd Smolden just sort of encapsulated my whole problem uh, with with the the form of the announcement in a tweet he put out yesterday. It says, for those of you who don't know, Todd Smolden is the governor's representative, at least he was, I think he still is, the governor's representative uh, in the Matsu. Um, this is this is the tweet he put out. Has the average family of four figured out that they are receiving $10,000 less than they could have because of the latest AKLEG, which stands for the Alaska legislature, the last uh, uh, legislature uh, uh, PFD cut. And and basically what Todd's trying to do is shift the burden, shift the blame for the PFD cut to the leg- legislature, which is where it somewhat belongs, not 100%, but maybe, you know, 60, 67%, two thirds belongs uh, over with the legislature. But here's the deal. No, Todd, an average family of four hasn't figured out that they're receiving $10,000 less because the governor's announcement, which was the perfect opportunity to make that point, to talk about the PFD cut, the size of the PFD cut at the same time you're talking about the PFD, to have a press release, to have a press statement that would then be reflected in the ADN and in the press elsewhere about how much the size of the PFD cut was, the governor's announcement didn't, did not make that point. The governor's announcement just said, Adam Crumb, smiling, just said, you get $1,312. Aren't you lucky? Aren't you lucky? (laughs) It didn't say you could have gotten, you know, $3,700 or whatever the right number is. You could have gotten a heck of a lot more had it not been for the legislature cutting it down to thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean, so, I would have been I would have been really tempted if I was governor to make Crum or whoever it was, or even the governor himself, to unveil the card like they used to do. Remember, they used to unveil the card like it was a big, you know, like it was a lottery number or something. And I would do that, except it would be the forty two hundred and seventeen dollars, and I'd go, "Oops." We were going to give you that, but the legislature decided that they needed most of that money. So I'm sorry, this number is not right. Here's the real number, $1,312. The legis- You'll have to take it up with the legislature where your other $3,000 per person went. That's what I would have done. I mean, it, that, it w- that sends a strong message. It does. It was the perfect opportunity for the governor to do that. The perfect opportunity to get that in, out in the press, talk about PFD cuts, as a tax or talk about them however you want to talk about them if you don't want to if you don't want to say they're a tax the perfect opportunity to get that out there and um and the governor didn't do it uh and in fact you know the smiling announcement of thirteen hundred dollars was just sort of an affront to 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 you know to those of us who think about it in terms of the amount cut so todd no <laughs> no people don't think about it that way because your administration uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't make it a priority. I, I will say a couple of things. We, so we get a lot of, so we get a lot of articles in, in virtually every paper in the state talking about the $1,300 and, you know, and, and, and how that's, you know, great and all that sort Aren't of stuff. We lucky? Aren't we lucky? Um, I will say, I will say this, cause I, I, I do want to give credit when it's due. The ADN reporting side did, in the absence of the governor making the point about the cut, the ADN reporting side sort of did a decent job of putting it in context, not fully. And I'll, and I'll add where I complain about it in just a moment, not fully, but they sort of put it in, in decent context. For example, they led with a chart that shows the inflation adjusted amounts of the PFD over time and shows that this PFD is one of the smaller, after after inflation adjustments, this PFD is one of the smaller PFDs uh, on record. And I think at least putting it in the context, if you're not going to talk about it as a cut, at least putting it in the context of inflation adjusted was uh, a good thing. The, the, the ADN also, 
at the very end um, included this paragraph. The payment is much smaller than the $2,700 payment backed by the House Republicans earlier this year and still less than the $3,900 dividend that Republican Mike Dun Governor Mike Dunleavy proposed in his budget draft last year. So at least that paragraph is sort of putting it in the context of, of a cut. But then they entirely undo it with the last sentence, which is both options would have committed the state to spending hundreds of millions of dollars, dollars more than it had in revenue. And, and, it, and, and that sentence ties, I mean, it goes back to the first point we were making today, that, that sentence ties the, the PFD to spending, says that you would have had to have had additional revenues to have a higher PFD. No, <laughs> you needed additional revenues to, to avoid the PFD cut, to avoid using PFD as taxes, PFD cuts as taxes. You, you didn't need that additional revenue in order to pay the, pay out the PFD. The PFD is fully funded from, from the earnings reserve. So the ADN sort of helped put it in context with, with the inflation adjustment and sort of helped put it in context, sort of helped put it in context by mentioning the the higher numbers that the House Republicans and the governor initially started out with, but then they sort of undid it with the with the reference uh, with the reference at the end to saying, you know, we 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 would have had to have more revenues in order to pay for a higher for a higher uh, PFD. No, we needed more revenues in order to pay for all the other spending that was going on. Um, it is uh, it, it is it is disappointing. I can't I can't stress enough how disappointing it is. That this governor, and I guess the legislature, because I don't, I didn't see any quotes from any of the legislators to this point. It is disappointing that we didn't put this PFD in the context of spending cuts. Uh, it's disappointing to see someone from the administration complain about people not understanding, not having the opportunity to understand how much was taken out of taken out of their pocket when, in fact, the administration had it within their power to have put that number in to have put how much was was being cut. Uh, in. So I think I think there's a missed opportunity here, both by the administration and by legislators. Um, and I think the press just ran ran off in the wrong direction again, uh, because those who have the power to help direct the press and the administration chose not to do it. Hasn't this been, though, a problem overall with the Dunleavy administration for the last two or three years is that they just have not engaged and taken advantage of opportunities for public outreach and for reaching out to their base? Um, and engaging that base that would be receptive to that message. I mean, that, that seems to me that seems to be a misstep by the current administration is that they've just stopped engaging the public on this issue. He's really stopped talking about it. He stopped talking about anything to the to the Alaska public. I, to anything, yeah. But the, this, the, the, the administration has been intimidated. This administration has been intimidated. Uh, you know, however tall the governor is, he's been intimidated by the legislature, by the, by the pushback in 2019, uh, uh, of, of the, of the recall effort, um, and by subsequent, uh, calls by legislative leaders like Gary Stevens and Bert Stedman and others who have, who have, you know, have praised him sort of when he's been quiet and gone along with them and roll and, and allowed them to roll him, uh, and then criticized him as being, you know, not mature or whatever the heck they criticize him as when he's when he's tried to stand up for the Alaskans that elected him. So it's it, it's consistent with the intimidation that the, that this administration has shown uh, uh, since 2019. It's consistent with uh, them them allowing themselves to be rolled by the administration since 2019. Disappointing as hell, uh, but but consistent with that. We, you know, the, the, that's part of the problem. Again, I would have just stood up and told people uh, at the beginning of that press conference uh, on the uh, first of all, I as governor, I would have done it. I would have done it because the governor usually did it. I wouldn't have put the I wouldn't have put a lackey in there. I wouldn't have put crumb in there as the guy to do it. I would have done it. And I would have done again the two cards. The first one that falls down is, oh, look, it was forty two hundred. Oh, no. See, it would have been this. But the legislature decided that they knew better how to spend your money than you did. So right, really what you're getting is next call for, call, uh, card falls. You're really only getting 1,312. But be lucky that you're getting that, that the legislature allowed you to have that much. I mean, play it up for all it's worth. They could call you whatever names they want, but the people would see it. It would be a shocking comparison 
they would understand it. I, I mean, I just don't know why it, it, I just don't know why he's not engaging it more. Like you said, he has been intimidated, but what are they going to do? Vote him out of office? He's, I mean, at this point, you're done. Just go ahead. You're on a lame duck. Do it. Well, yeah, I think the long-term plan by, by, by those who manipulate the governor is to, for, to get him to run against Lisa. And they just don't want to do, they don't care about Alaska, frankly. It's just, it's just all focused on getting him ready to run for Lisa. And they don't want him to suffer the slings and arrows of another, uh, of another recall effort or another, you know, criticism by the legislature. They just want him to go along and get along. Hell, it got him elected, you know, in the, in the last election, got him reelected. Of course, there weren't any other candidates to, to talk about, but, but got him reelected in the last, in the, in the last election. So I think they just, I think his handlers just want him to go along to get along and just don't want him to, you know, to, to ruffle feathers and, and, you know, to go on Fox and talk about, you know, yeah. the Biden administration and rail against the Biden administration, file all sorts of suits uh, against the Biden administration and prepare him to run against Lisa. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, Alaska, the, the fact that he's governor of Alaska and Alaska has taken it, takes it in, takes a hit because, because he doesn't want to battle for Alaskans. I, I, that's just, you know, that's just part of the collateral damage, I suppose. It's just so painful to watch. I mean, I don't know how, um, uh, I just don't know how his advisors can continue to look him in the face and he, or he can just be like, I'll just sit in the corner here waiting for my next election, uh, because I'm going to be Senator or what, I mean, you still got a job to do. You need to stand up. You got elected twice. Well, I mean, what the hell stand up for Alaskans, do what's need, engage them, talk with them, do the things that need to be done. Stop listening to these political Muppet masters who, who think that, Oh God, I'm just so frustrated. So that, frustrated. That's, with this whole thing. That's, that's not what he's about, Michael. He's not about being the governor of Alaska anymore. He's about being a candidate in some fashion, being a candidate for Senate to run against Lisa. I mean, that's that's what he's about right now. And and he doesn't, that's the priority, right? That's in his mind, that's the priority. And in, in my view, that's the priority. And he doesn't want to do anything. His advisors, I'm not sure what Mike himself thinks about anything anymore but his advisors don't want him to you know suffer slings and arrows along the way they want him to stay this perfect you know candidate that doesn't get criticized that's always standing up for conservatives and and uh you know and always taking on the biden administration complaining about something do, do you have that chart that i that i sent you can you put the chart yeah. up on the oh yeah hold on a second i apologize i gotta pull it no, no, and no. put it up quick um, no, okay. i got i just uh, I, it, it makes it makes the point that we're talking about in a different way and this is the sort of thing that that if I, if either of us were legislators of course neither of us have been elected to anything yeah you were you were elected to something but i but yeah. neither of us have been elected to any current office but this is the sort of thing that i think you know would resonate with alaskans your idea of of, you know, having the, the chart of, you know, whatever the number would have been, I think the number would have been $3,400 after the calc after they came out with the 1312, I, it gave me some precise numbers to work with. So, um, it, but your idea of, of having the $3,400 and then, you know, striking it out or having another card saying that, that, that's, that's a great one. And, uh, and something that the, the, the administration certainly could have done. But this one, this chart to me, sort of sort of brings the point home in a different way. This chart shows what the level of the PFD would have been. That's the numbers at the top. What the level of the PFD would have been uh, had it been paid according to the statutory formula. Um, and then in blue, it shows the number of the PFD that was paid. The portion in red is the amount that was cut, the amount that was taxed. And at the, on the top of the chart, I've got a statement, uh, 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 Matt Berman's statement uh, from earlier this year. Let's be honest, a cut in the PFD is a tax, the most regressive tax ever proposed. And the amounts in red are showing the amount of, uh, the, amount of the tax. The line uh, that's running through the chart is the percentage of the cut. Uh, in other words, the tax rate on the PFD that that essentially the uh, uh, the legislature enacted, and it shows over the course of the last since 2017 when they started this, in none of those years has the has the legislature paid the full statutory PFD, 
Um, in all of those years, they have been deep cuts. The average, I have the average at the end, the average over the over the course of the since 2017 has been a 52% cut in the statutory PFD that Alaskans would have received on average about $3,000, $3,100. Uh, as the PFD, on average, they received fifteen hundred dollars, half of that, um, as the as the PFD, and and I that's the sort of thing that I think um, I think would resonate with Alaskans, sh- showing what the number would have been, and what the and and the amount that's been cut, the amount that the legislature, I mean, I'll give it to Dunleavy, I, the amount the legislature has cut, I'll take him off the hook for that, the amount the legislature. Uh, has cut. And and that would be, you know, if you and I are both saying the same thing, if that were the announcement that we were making, that we would, we wanted to pay you, we would have paid you, I proposed to pay you, in the case of FY24, $3,400 after all the numbers were in and after all the calculations were done, $3,400. But the legislature only appropriated to you $1,300. They took $2,000 out of your pocket you know, extrapolate it to families of four. They took $8,000 out of your pocket. Um, if the legislature, if, if, if they would do that, I think that would resonate. And if the administration did that, as opposed to me doing it on, on your show, no offense, but the, the press doesn't live or die by what we do on this show. If, if, if the administration did that, the press would be forced to pick it up. So anyway, yeah. that, that that's the sort of point that we should be making when we have the PFD announcements, not, Goody, goody, you get thirteen hundred dollars. Right, it, I know. It, it would have been, you know, thirty four hundred dollars. You only get thirteen. The weekly top three continues. Uh, let's get into number three, which is the direction that the Permanent Fund Corporation is going. Their pieces that they're putting out, and the overall kind of direction and push you can see coming down the pike here, Brad. So Devin Mitchell, uh, who's the who's the new uh, recently appointed uh, uh, president of the Permanent Fund. Uh, corporation wrote an opinion piece uh, in the ADN and well, all the state newspapers. Um, and the the headline that's given it in the ADN is providing for generations of Alaskans. And it talks about, you know, how the, the, the work of the permanent fund corporation and what they're doing. Essentially, it's a preset for two things. The, the, the column is a preset for two things. One, it's a preset for the for the annual report that the permanent fund is going to be publishing this week, incorporating the results of the last fiscal year. And the results of the last fiscal year were, were not great. I mean, they were good compared to compared to some market measures, but they were not great. It got an overall 5% return, which that's the, that's the inflation that includes inflation. So after you subtract the 8% inflation, uh, the real rate of return was a minus 3%. Uh, actually lost money from a, from an inflation standpoint. Um, and so it, it, they weren't great. And it's sort of a preset, try to vote. You know, if you got bad news, get it out there quickly and get it with your spin on it as opposed to, as opposed to uh, letting somebody else spin it for you. So it's, part, it's in part a preset for that. And it's in part a preset for what uh, they re- he refers to as the trustees paper uh, number ten that's that's in that's being that's in draft stage, and and he says it's going to be released either later this year or early next next year. What trustees paper ten is going to be is a push to eliminate to 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 cons- to have a, uh, a constitutional amendment to consolidate the earnings reserve with the permanent fund corpus, and then and then take away the permanent fund earnings, take away the. The, the 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 flexibility of the permanent fund earnings just consolidated all together, and then have all, the. Yeah. I'm sorry. Put it all into the corpus basically, and make the corpus right. attainable. Right, and then and then just have the POMV work off the corpus, and you and you, what you do is you take away the the flexibility that the earnings reserve has has for you, and as part of this push, I mean we talked we talked about this on a couple of shows back, I think, as part of this push. The, the the permanent fund corporation has started contorting their uh, their their financial statements to make the earnings reserve look you know like it's almost out of money or almost running out of money 
um, and and that you know we have to do this before the permanent fund earnings reserve runs out of money or there's not going to be enough money in the earnings reserve. Forget about dividends, they'll be gone. There's not going to be much, much enough money in the earnings reserve to pay uh, the POMB to, to pay for pay for government and pay inflation proofing uh, to go back to uh, to go back to the permanent fund corpus. And so his article, while it's couched in, oh, look at all the great things the Permanent Fund Corporation does. It's really centered on trying to do those two things. One, taking the sting out of the bad news is going to come from the annual report. And two, pushing the trustees paper as a, as a, as a, as a way forward. It, it's sort of a, I mean, we're sort of backing in to a, to a campaign here. At the same time, the same week, um, James Brooks did, a, uh, did an interview with Alaska Public Media and the headline of that is Alaska heading toward fiscal brick wall that could force end the PFD formula debate. Actually, what, what it's trying to say is Alaska heading toward fiscal brick wall that could force end the PFD. And again, it's built around this, this, this problem that the PFD permanent fund corporation is trying to create with the earnings reserves. Um, and then there's a, so that's sort of the, another step in the, in the effort, in this effort, this building campaign to, to, to undo the, the earnings reserve. And then today, I was noticing as I was getting ready for the show, listening to your great music, lead-in music, by the way, uh, I, I noticed this article in the Alaska Beacon that's published this morning, uh, headline, Alaska Permanent Fund Improves After Money Losing Year, But Withdrawals Still Exceed Earnings. Um, the, the corporation's earnings need to average 5% plus rate of inflation to be sustainable. Over the past five years, the corporation hasn't done that. And it's and basically, this whole article is built around, you know, the the stress on the earnings reserve and the need to to merge the earnings reserve uh, into the into the permanent fund corpus. So we've got a camp, we've got a camp, a political campaign being built here right. using, you know, Devin's uh, uh, article and commentary editorial in the in the various papers around the state. They're going to use the annual report for the same purpose. They're going to use this trustees paper number ten coming up uh, for the same purpose. Interestingly, though, interestingly, I'll say this um, in the in the um, uh, September newsletter put out by the Legislative Finance Division, which got uh, uh, highlighted to me last night. Uh, there's a segment in there talking about the year end balance uh, headline year end balances and projections. And it talks about why the Legislative Finance Division, whenever it publishes numbers, focuses on projected year-end numbers or actual year-end numbers as opposed to monthly numbers. And it says this, third monthly figures only include balance, uh, only include investment returns for part of the year, which may understate the expected year-end balance. Given how volatile investment returns can be from month to month, we try to avoid putting too much stock in investment returns until late in the fiscal year. In our fiscal summaries, we use year-end projected figures and only update those values when better information is available from audited financial figures. Monthly cash balances are often misleading and should be used with extreme caution. Well, it's ex exactly those monthly balances that, that legislative finance is criticizing that the PF Permanent Fund Corporation is using to create this all this right. concern about the, and, about the right. permanent fund earnings. Right, so, creating crisis so they can they can offer the solution for the crisis they're using those monthly numbers uh as well it's uh i mean it's it's astonishing that this is the direction that they're that, that they're going in and as i've said many many times the pot of money that big fat pot of money the corpus is the ultimate target and goal this push to eliminate the era and give the pomv access to the corpus is the biggest run at the permanent fund we've ever seen. And it's almost a stealth run. They couch it in different terms. So you don't understand that this is going to give them access to that big pot of money. And they're going to be, they're going to, they're going to get access to it and they're going to try and take it. That's the whole game plan here. If, if you remember the discussion we had a couple of weeks ago, I was going through my waterfall chart that said that, that, that showed how they get down to this very low balance for the ERA and then build it back up. Uh, to show the adjustments that should be made for it, um, and and we publish those, we publish that chart monthly as part of our investment series. The latest one got published on Saturday for people who want to who want to go look at it uh, as part of a our, on Alaskans for fiscal or for sustainable budgets uh, Facebook page. It got published on Saturday. 
Um, interestingly enough, one of the adjustments we make is to is to restore a, a deduction that the Permanent Fund Corporation makes for next year's uh, 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 POMB draw. Not not only do they reduce the Permanent Fund earnings of balance for the current year's POMB draw and for the current year's inflation proofing, hell, they even take out next year's POMB draw to try to get to try to get the yeah. number as low as it can. <laughs> And the and the legislative finance division criticizes that approach as well in the September newsletter. So I feel somewhat vindicated. Right. Well, I mean, it, here's my biggest question, Brad. The PFD, they're talking about it. it's going to hit the wall. PFD is going to disappear. We know, based on past performance of legislatures, that even if the PO, even if the PFD completely disappears and they consumed all of those dollars, their track record is is that they will then need more. I mean, do these people not see that there will be taxes in the future? Do they not see that? Is it is it is it willful blindness? We got two minutes here. What what are your thoughts on on because it's coming? If the PFD disappears, there will inevitably be taxes on top of it. Are they just ignoring I, that? Or I think, think there's I think there's two things going on. I think I think the 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 leaders think they can stop taxes after the PFD is gone. I think they think they can draw a line and say, okay, we gave up the PFD. We gave up the middle and lower income Alaskans PFD. We gave up the PFD, uh, but we can stop spending now. We'll, we'll, we'll cap spending. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it, we'll keep it uh, uh, steady from here on out. And in fact, the ADN editorial that I, that, that so enraged me uh, talks in fact about, you know, the spending cap, that would that would you know would lead to the obliteration of the PFD, but then it'd be a spending cap from 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 there on out. So I think they one I think they think they can stop it. Two, I think they they think even if we can't stop it, at least we've lessened the impact on us on the top twenty percent. Uh, at least we've lessened the impact on us by taking away the PFD first, taking away things that that don't matter to us first. And yeah, we may pay a small tax, but it's a lot less than we would. If we hadn't, you know, given up the PFD, given up middle and lower income Alaskan families, PFD. That's what that's what just flummoxes me on this whole deal is, again, looking at the track record, looking at the past performance, looking at the baked in escalators in the budget already. We know it's going to go up 100 million, 150 million a year, every year. Um, regardless, even if even if they just held it flat, it's going to go up every year. So we know that in just a short period of time, a couple, three, four years, they'll need that six, seven hundred million dollars that they're giving us in the PFD right now. They'll need that on top of taking everything. So it's inevitable. It's in the future. And yet everybody acts like this will be the solution. We'll just take the PFD. It'll be fine. This is the ultimate game of kicking the can down the road. It is. I mean, I there to some degree. <laughs> They're convincing themselves. The ADN is 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 at the lead of this. They're convincing themselves they're going to get a spending cap. I mean, if you ask if you ask the ADN, do you support any fiscal measures? They would say yes. We support a. In fact, they say it in the editorial. We support a fiscal cap that includes the PFD. The effect of including the PFD is to raise the the amount of the cap. So you, so when the PFD is consumed, you have more spending overall. But they but but they want a fiscal cap a spending cap that they believe will protect them from ever having to pay taxes on the other side. It gives up the PFD. It gives up the thing that's important to middle and lower income Alaska families, but it protects the top 20% non-residents, the old companies from, from taxes on the other side. So they're, they're, they're thinking, their thinking is we're going to protect ourselves. We're going to, you know, throw the middle and lower income Alaska families overboard uh, and throw the PFD overboard. But we're going to protect ourselves through uh, through this spending cap, and I and and that's I think that's what they've convinced themselves of. But again, as I say, even if they would tell, they would say, even if we don't do that, even if the cap doesn't protect us, the taxes we're going to pay are going to be small because we've 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 thrown the middle and lower income Alaska families, we've thrown the PFD overboard um, uh, first, and so they they're going to suffer. Middle and lower income Alaska families are going to suffer huge tax rates, but but our tax the tax rates when they finally get to us, the tax rates are going to be small. They're probably I mean they probably are deluding themselves. If we have this show ten years from now, 
we're all going to be in trouble. But but if we have this show 10 years from now, uh, we'll probably look back and say, oh, wasn't that stupid? They thought they could stop it. They couldn't. And now the tax rates are high on everybody, um, them included. Uh, but but that's what they're telling themselves now. They they think they can stop it through through this spending cap that James Kaufman and and you know and, and others uh, are pushing and the and the ADN's pushing and Natasha pushed in her in her last days. That's what's important to them. Get that spending cap. Throw the PFD overboard, but get that spending cap to protect us against uh, against taxes uh, going forward. And of course, <clears throat> and it, it only Rob makes the point. It's uh, it only works if it's constitutional. The spending cap only works if it's constitutional. You don't get that without settling the PFD too. Um, <clears throat> that's that's the bottom line, uh, and that's the push we're seeing. We saw what happened with Will Stapp. We saw the the spending cap come out of the house and at the last minute get that addendum of including the PFD under the same cap. It's all part and parcel of trying to take down the permanent fund. That's uh, the, the dividend. That's what it all comes down to. You know, Rob's point was was an excellent point, and it goes back to our first issue, which is why the hell is Kathy Tilton giving up on a comprehensive plan? Right. I mean, Rob's point is you're only going to get X if you if somebody else gets Y. This is only going to work if everybody comes together and and gives a little bit and and truly has a comprehensive fiscal plan. People are holding back out, you know, and holding their holding their breath, saying, "I'm going to get mine." I don't care about yours. I'm going to hold out for mine. They're just not, as Rob points out, they may get it in statute, but the statute's going to be wiped out. Right. Down the road. <clears throat> exactly. His number two is number two. That was his first point. A spending cap can also fail and be repealed if the state keeps making money while the private sector fails. Again, going back to his original question of, is it really a good thing that we're funding government out of the permanent fund itself instead? Again, that disconnect between the public and the private sectors. Yeah. And that's that's why you need to have Rob on for his own for his own segment, because he 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 speaks eloquently uh, to those issues. I have my own issues that I talk about, but 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 Rob speaks elo- eloquently to those issues. And they're and they're and they're equally or more important issues than than the ones I talk about. But it's it, it, to get this solution, to get a solution, it's got to be everything together. And I just, you know, Ben Carpenter, to me, some people call him a right wing you know, right wing nut. Uh, I think Matt Buxton had a piece this week that talked him talked about him as a right wing nut. Actually, Ben Carpenter, in terms of what's been proposed, is the most progressive member of the legislature. All the Democrats can talk about is PFD cuts. Ben has actually put a solution out there that's less regressive than PFD cuts in in his proposed in his proposed sales tax. Ben is actually, I think, putting together has really thought about these issues is putting together a comprehensive plan. And it's just sad to see Tilton uh, abandoning it um, halfway through her term. She didn't even get halfway through her term, right. uh, uh, abandoning it uh, uh, already. It's, well, it's almost it's, an admission of defeat, right? Because I can't corral the cats. So we're just going to let them run amok essentially is what she's saying. Exactly. And, and we'll try to press forward. And, 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 you know, and her attitude is let me press the one thing that I think my constituents want most. And so they'll think highly of me. Well, Kathy, if your constituents understand what's going on, they're going to think highly of you for pressing forward with a comprehensive plan. They're not going to think highly of you for, you know, taking a piece of it and letting everything else you know, uh, go, go by the go side. Other side. Yeah. Brad, thank you so much, my friend. As always, it's infuriating, but good. Thank you Michael, so much. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.